Well, I heard about one 90-year-old lady that just kind of was overwhelmed with all of the hassle of Christmas, and she decided that she wasn't going to do all that shopping and try to find gifts, but instead she was just going to write a check and put a check and a card and send it to all of her loved ones. And so she wrote out all the checks, and then she got out her cards, and she signed her name to each card and then put a little note that, you know, buy your own gift. And then she realized a week after Christmas, she found the checks still in the desk drawer. So she had sent out all of the cards that just said, buy your own gift with no check. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy busy time of year and those things can happen, right? So I gave you gentlemen some advice last week, and I'm going to do it again this week. When it comes to buying gifts, the most important thing is not how expensive the gift is, although that, that helps, but that's not the most important thing. And it's not even how beautifully it's wrapped. Just remember, the most important thing is that you save the receipt. <laughs> yeah. And one for the ladies just to identify with that, in uh, Women's Day magazine a few years back, they ran an article about how you can make your own wrapping paper by printing a design on plain paper with the apple sli sliced halfway across and you dip it in this uh, food coloring and starch and then stamp it on the paper. And um, all I got to say is, is who has time for that? I mean, people with chauffeurs and maids and chefs maybe, but the rest of us live in a real world, and here's the world we live in, that Christmas is the craziest time of the year. It is the busiest time of the year, and yet on a Sunday morning before Christmas, we found the time to worship our Savior, and I invite you with me to just slow down this morning and just leave all of the stress and all the hassle, all the busyness aside and let's focus in on the Christmas story this morning from Luke chapter 2. My family and I read this story and then have prayer before we share gifts. It is a tradition and contrary to the popular attitude that all traditions need to be thrown out, Sometimes you find a tradition that truly has meaning and purpose and it's worth hanging on to. And we need to remember that in the body of Christ. Oh, not tradition just for tradition's sake. Sure, there are vain and foolish traditions, but it's okay to have good traditions. I just want to encourage you in that. But let's read the story. It begins in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census was first taken while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. 
But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. This morning I want to share with you the message of the manger. The manger speaks to us. You know, the angel said very plainly, we bring you good tidings of great joy. And we talked about that great joy last week that the message brings. But a Savior has been born. The message of the manger is a message of salvation, that He has come to save us. He comes and saves us from all of our sinful human condition It is a message of forgiveness. It is a message of redemption, a message of restoration of the relationship between God and man. It's a message of healing. It is a message of freedom for the captives. It is a message of God's grace that when there was nothing we could do to save ourselves, a Savior came to rescue us. The message of the manger is that He has not left us alone to struggle on our own and try to make it our own in this world where there's so much suffering in this broken world, but rather that He has stepped into this world and He has stepped into our world personally to help us, to save us. Whatever you're going through, you need to know that there is a Savior who wants to help you. The message of the manger is a message of peace. The angels declared it, peace on earth. And certainly we get a sense of peace when we consider that first Christmas with the babe lying in the manger, Mary and Joseph there and the shepherds have come. But understand this, that that kind of quiet peace doesn't last. No, it was just a short time later that Herod issues a decree that all boys two years and under would be put to death trying to get rid of this baby king. Oh, there was all kinds of turmoil and strife in the world, and so there is in our day and our time. But the peace that Jesus brings, the peace that Jesus gives, is a peace the world can't take away. It is not dependent upon situation and circumstance. You see, the world's idea of peace is a peace that's external. It's temporary and it's fleeting. And oh, we've all seen that. Even if you have a moment's peace, it'll pass. But here's the thing, Jesus gives us an eternal peace, an internal peace. It is a peace that cannot be shaken. It's a peace on the inside that's always with us. That's the peace that He offers to us. And that is a part of the message of the manger that God wants us to have peace. The message of the manger is that God is for you. In the Christmas story, the angels announce goodwill toward men. You see, God is not against you. He's for you. It is goodwill towards you. He is predisposed to be kind to you, to do good to you. That's who He is. And the Bible asks this question in Romans 8 31 If God is for us, who can be against us? You need to know that God is for you. In that manger that day when the gift of God's Son was given, we need to understand that God is ever for us. He's not against us. He's not mad at you. He's not out to get you. No, He wants to show you His goodness. Psalms 145 and verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all His works. Now, when He says He's good to all, that includes me. And guess what? That includes you. The Lord is good to all. The message of the manger is that God always has a plan and a time. The Bible says in Galatians 4.4 that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. It was just the right time. It was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before. God had a plan from the beginning of time to redeem man, 
but it was just the right time that God sent His Son. He came at a very dark time in the world. In many ways, it was the worst of times. But when the Son of God comes and He walks this earth, then it becomes the best of times. Wouldn't you like to have lived during that time? But you know what? We're still living in a time when God has a plan. And He has a plan for each and every life, including yours. And sometimes we are praying and we are waiting for the fulfillment of things and we don't understand what's taking so long. It seems like it'll never get here. But just like in the fullness of time, God brought His plan to pass, so He does in our lives. We just have to trust Him and stand in faith when we are believing and we are waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. But that day will come. And the message of the manger is, is there, there is a plan and there is a time. The message of the manger tells us that he has come to be with us. In Matthew chapter 1, 21 through 23, it says, And she will bring forth a son, you will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. It's the prophet Isaiah, and we'll read that in a minute saying, Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He came to be with us. He came to earth in a human form, in a human body, to be with us. We need to understand that though Jesus is no longer walking this earth in a human body, he is still with us through the person of the Holy Spirit, that God, Emmanuel, God with us. He's still here. And we need to know that whatever we're dealing with, whatever we go through, God is with us. In the good times, in the hard times, in the lonely times, He's with us. When we're in the crowd, He's with us. When we're in a battle, He's with us. When we go through the valley of the shadow of death, He's with us. He's always with us. But the manger tells us, Emmanuel has come. God came to be with us. You know, the religions of man are all about man trying to reach God somehow. And really, in reality, they are about man inventing God and inventing their own system of how to reach that God that they made up. But our God... He reached down to us. He came down to us that day in the manger. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's our God. He came to be with us. That greatest gift, the gift of God's Son, a baby boy born in a manger. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifested in the flesh. Now, I want you to realize this. It doesn't say sort of kind of God. It doesn't say a little bit of God. It says God was manifested in the flesh. And I know in this crazy religious culture, there's a lot of people a little little confused or they got a little doubt about this. You need to know that you know that you know that Jesus was fully God. It was God. The Bible says God manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. We need to understand that God gave His Son, but when He did so, He also was giving Himself for us because that was God manifested in the flesh. In the person of the Son, He came to earth in a bodily form. That's what was prophesied 750 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Just as a side note, they found scrolls, they call them the Dead Sea Scrolls of the book of Isaiah that were written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. And here's what Isaiah says in chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's God with us. But get this. 750 years before, 
Isaiah prophesies that a virgin will give birth to a son. Now there are these theological critics today that want to try to tell us that there is no virgin birth. That, well, that's not really a, a proper translation. That It doesn't really say that. But here's what you need to know, that without a virgin, virgin birth, there is no sinless life. Because without a virgin birth, then he would have been born a part of Adam's race and born a sinner just like the rest of us. But he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life so he could die a death on a cross and pay the price for all of our sins. And we need to know that he was fully man, but he was also fully God. Two chapters later in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, Unto us a child is born. I want you to remember he's saying, A child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. This child that is born, a son that is given, he's going to be called the Mighty God. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about worshiping a man? No, we're talking about the mighty God who came to earth as a baby in a manger. The everlasting Father. How can the child, the Son, be the everlasting Father? Because He and the Father are one. Prince of Peace. That's who He is. I don't know how people can doubt that Jesus was truly God. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not just a little bit, but all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in that body. We need to know what Christmas is really about. I'm telling you, it is about God coming to be with us. It is about God coming to restore the relationship with God and man. He came to walk in our shoes, to live where we live, to experience all the things that we go through, and to pay the price for our sins with His own life. The message of the manger is that He uses imperfect people in adverse situations and circumstances to perform the greatest miracles. Here's a young woman. Think about Mary. Here's a young woman who's pregnant, but not yet married. Now, we all know the story. We understand the purity of it. We understand how wonderful. But can you imagine what it was like for her in her day, and for Joseph as well? You hear this young woman is pregnant, and she's not married. How difficult it must have been for this unwed mother. Now she is idolized and even worshipped by some. But the truth is, is that Mary, in the eyes of man, was an ordinary, average nobody. When they showed up at the inn, the innkeeper didn't say, oh, oh, it's Mary and Joseph. We got got the suite for y'all. They said, there's no place here. You can go out to the barn. Ordinary people. They weren't treated as special. Here they were in the most difficult situation that maybe only someone who is a mom can understand, but this woman had to travel at nine months pregnant. She didn't travel in a car. She traveled by foot or at best on a donkey at nine months pregnant. Can you imagine? And they get to their destination and she gives birth out in the stable. Adversity. Not at all the way that I'm sure that she had imagined things would go in her life. And you see, we all have adversity and things that didn't go the way that we had imagined. 
We all find ourselves in the midst of situations that maybe sometimes almost seem too much to bear. But realize in this story, in all of this adversity, and these ordinary people, imperfect people, God did the miracle of all miracles in sending His Son as a Savior for us. And in our lives, when we're dealing with all kinds of adversity and problems and things just aren't perfect and we have weaknesses and we're ordinary and we struggle, it is in the very midst of that that God can show up and do a miracle in our life, do a miracle through our life. I'm just telling you that that's the message of the manger, that he uses ordinary, imperfect people. And in the midst of every kind of trouble imaginable, you see, your life doesn't have to be perfect for God to show up. No, it's in the midst of our trouble that he shows up and that God does miracles in our life. You know, if we were God, we would have made sure that Mary went to the best hospital in town. Amen? Sure we would have. But you see, God wanted us to know that even in our lives when everything's going sideways, it doesn't stop the plan of God. Now I'm telling you, there is a message of the manger there. It tells us that in imperfect people and imperfect situations with imperfect lives he can do a perfect miracle he performed the perfect redemption of mankind the manger speaks of us to us of a God who identifies with the poor and humble he came in the most humble way He identifies with not just the lucky ones, but the unfortunate ones. He identifies with the single mother. He identifies with those that are hurting, regular people. He identifies with those that feel insignificant. That's what the manger tells us. Here are our God... He chooses these lowly shepherds. You know, there are several great men of God in the Scripture who were shepherds. But you need to know that a shepherd was one of the lowest jobs that you could have in that culture. It was not an easy life. In fact, when you read the Christmas story there, it says these shepherds were living out in the fields with their sheep. That was their life. And God chose these lowly shepherds to be the ones to come and witness the Son of God born in a manger. He chose these lowly shepherds to be the first to testify and to tell of what had happened that day. Who knows what God might choose you to do? Who knows what your testimony is? might impact somebody else's eternity. But the manger tells us that God uses the ordinary, He uses the lowly, the humble, and we need to always, always remember how He came because it tells us that He can use us. He can use our lives. He can step into our life at any moment. The message of the manger more than anything else, the most obvious message of the manger is that God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You need to know beyond any shadow of a doubt, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter whether or not you can feel it, God loves you. That's what the manger tells you, is that God sent His Son because He loves you. And nothing can ever change that. Nothing will ever take that away. I love the old children's song. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter how I feel. 
The Bible tells me so. This morning, I'm telling you, the manger also tells me so. Don't ever forget the message of the manger. God loves you. He's for you. Stand with me. We're going to pray.